Hello and welcome to this week in South Carolina In Session. I'm Gavin Jackson here at the State House in Columbia. Well, we just wrapped up the eighth legislative week here of the session with lawmakers only having nine weeks left to finish their agendas before the end of session. We did see a lot of activity today up here at the State House, including the House lawmakers and a Judiciary Subcommittee moving along two bills that would deal that deal with energy production in the state. One deals with solar energy production and raising a cap for that. Another one deals with energy efficiency programs in the state. Both of those got pushed along to the full committee. Also, we saw senators uh, take up a bill in the Senate Medical Affairs Committee that would prohibit dismemberment abortions from taking place in the state. That bill now goes to the Senate floor and is joined with the personhood bill that the Senate Judiciary Committee moved along previously. Also, we caught up with Senator Luke Rakin, who's the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, which has a subcommittee that's been hearing nuclear re uh, regulatory utility reform bills that have been passed over from the House, as well as Senate bills that are before that committee. He's been dealing with some criticism about how the Senate might be potentially slow walking bills. Uh, that criticism is heavily lauded from the House and lawmakers that have moved bills over to the Senate. So we catch up with him and get his thoughts on that. And we also hear from some House lawmakers, about House and Senate lawmakers, about an um, attempt to get a, uh, a referendum going to call a constitutional convention to change up the state's constitution. However, it's already hitting several roadblocks, uh, both from the Democratic Party and from other lawmakers. And we round out today's events with a visit to the School Safety Summit where Governor Henry McMaster was talking about what he wants to see done in schools as well as Superintendent uh, Molly Spearman, Superintendent of Education Molly Spearman and State Law Enforcement Division Chief Mark Keel. So we have a huge uh, platter of things to talk about, so let's get right into it right now. A House panel unanimously approved a bill H4421 to increase solar energy production in South Carolina. The bill would lift the 2% cap on residential solar power generation. Without it, solar companies would shed jobs and solar growth would stall. It now goes to the full Judiciary Committee. Three uh, CEOs of solar companies indicating that the cap, which is looming, is real and it is will result in the loss of 3,000 jobs. I don't think after the VC summer failure and the loss of 5,700 jobs, um, we want to do anything uh, or we want to do everything we can to make sure that we didn't don't lose any further jobs, particularly in this sector. And this is something that our state, in my opinion, desperately needs um, to move in the right direction um, towards having energy independence. And um, I, I greatly appreciate it. And thank you for your work, Mr. Smith. And when you look at where we stand compared to our neighboring states, we're still 15 years behind in terms of the development of uh, solar and renewable energy in our state. And I think we need to move forward. It's going to help us bring our rates back down. Uh, it's, it helps us be, to be more competitive, helps us to diversify our, our energy uh, sources, and, and it's just uh, it's a long time coming. So, you know, it, often you don't see movement in these areas and see this kind of change until you really have to push the envelope, and so that's what, what this bill does. And the Senate Medical Affairs Committee today moved along with the dismemberment abortion ban bill H3548 to the full Senate floor. It was a 9-6 party line vote today, which uh, again sends that bill to the Senate floor where the personhood bill, another controversial bill, is already waiting to be debated. However, it's unclear if either of these bills will have their time on the Senate floor to be fully debated since they are so controversial and there are several other uh, main issues that the Senate is looking to take up and if there is actually a willingness to take these bills up in the first place uh, such a move would require uh, some some major support to get these bills into special order slots which would give them debate priority status at this point it's not clear if either of those bills has that kind of support but let's get some more updates on this bill from the Senate Medical Affairs Committee that met earlier today but what, but I, what I really want members of the committee to know is that this will not affect 99 percent of the abortions in South Carolina. It's a limited, very limited few that happen uh, in the late trimester. And the reason is most often that the mother's life is in danger. And what is being done is an attempt to save the mother's life. Uh, and so to me, y'all, I say y'all, whoever, if, if what you're trying to do is just change policy, you're aiming at the wrong target. Because these are situations in which we're asking um, doctors at a time when the woman's life is probably most critical, she's, you know, whatever, seven or eight months pregnant, and something terrible is, look, if a woman is seven or eight months pregnant, 
she is pretty much committed to wanting to have that baby, all right? This is not a situation where all of a sudden that she's just saying on her own, I don't want to do this. This is a situation in which the doctor says, if you don't do this, your life is in danger and your other three children that you've got at home may end up without a mother. And what we're doing is we're saying to the women of South Carolina, if you've got enough money and you can fly uh, up to D.C. or New York or Virginia, wherever you can get this done, but if you're poor and you have children at home, uh, you know, you're just going to have to run the risk of losing your own life for your own health in a circumstance like this. Now, come on. Do we really want that to happen? I don't care. This child has feelings. This child can feel. Do we not think it's humane to put, give the child anesthesia before we do that? I mean, if this was a bill about puppies or chickens or whatever, we would have people lined so far down that hall to save a dog that we couldn't get them in the building. But we're talking about feeling sorry for unborn children, and we're fighting over whether or not we want to euthanize them before we tear them apart. I just can't even understand why we're having an argument here. And no, I'm not an attorney, and I'm not going to argue about whether we charge people $10,000 or whether we give them two years. I'm talking about children, and I'm talking about feelings, and I'm talking about these children can feel this when you're talking about an eight-month-old fetus, an unborn child, and you can talk about... Yeah, you can talk about Planned Parenthood all you want, and you can shake your head, and you can do that, but we're talking about somebody that has feelings, and that baby can feel. And a bipartisan, bicameral initiative by freshman lawmakers to reform the state's constitution received early support from Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey. However, it quickly ran aground in the House where Minority Leader Todd Rutherford said such a move, if it even happened, would lead to a more conservative constitution than that is already in place. Uh, this has kind of put some, has really kind of dampened the mood on this bill, which freshman lawmakers have kind of put forward in, in reaction to the slow pace up here in Columbia. Now, some Democrats did jump ship from the House, and others have kind of called out uh, Todd Rutherford and the Democratic Party, which also jumped in on this. Uh, calling that, that not completely necessary, not really in the spirit of what lawmakers are trying to do, which is to change the Constitution, which has not had a new version of the Constitution since 1895. We've amended the Constitution over the years. We've passed bills since then, but uh, they're looking to actually reform the Constitution and write a new one. However, it would require two-thirds of vote in the House and the Senate to move this resolution along and therefore would have to go, and then after that passes, would have to go to the voters of South Carolina to see if they would want uh, to see a change to the Constitution as well. So it's a complicated process to even call a state constitutional convention. Uh, and right now we've already seen that those efforts have been hampered already with an intraparty fighting. Uh, so it's unclear where this will go, but here's some comments from Senator William Timmons, uh, who's leading the fight over in the Senate. Um, I'm gonna be very brief. We have a 123 year old Constitution. The people that created it in 1895 did so um, with malice. They did it with malice. And I believe that in 2018, we can do better. I know that we, um, I know that we can do better. So I, I hope that I can get support from this body in the House. There are almost uh, 20 co-sponsors, all freshmen. Um, we thought it was appropriate to make this a, a freshman initiative out of the gate, but we really could use the support of the other members of this body, and um, I would ask that anybody willing would add their name as a co-sponsor and that we um, give this joint resolution consideration. I spoke with House Utility Ratepayer Protection Committee Chairman Peter McCoy today about accusations that uh, House lawmakers have been making against senators about slow walking some of these bills that the House has sent the Senate so far. Right now, we've, we've seen a subcommittee over in the Senate uh, kind of just make some minimal uh, headway on some of these bills and some of their own bills dealing with nuclear utility re uh, reforms in light of the VC summer nuclear debacle. Um, he gave me some comments. Uh, we have seen one bill come over from the Senate that would delay any action on the Public Service Commission uh, dealing with the Baseload Review Act. You might remember that that's, that's a controversial law in place since 2007 
which is sending $37 million of SCNG ratepayer money every month to pay for the now defunct nuclear reactor project. Um, so we're, we're, house lawmakers are a little bit more concerned about the constant pain for these, for these reactors that are going nowhere, whereas Senate lawmakers are saying they need to address these concerns as well. However, there are a lot of issues at play that they're considering, which is why it might seem like they are slow walking these bills. Um, that one bill, S-954, is over in the House. It was amended. Uh, they're going to take it up next week. Uh, we're going to have some more details about that bill later. But it would essentially, again, delay any actions before the PSC dealing with the Baseload Review Act. And then House lawmakers also amended it to deal with um, lowering that rate, getting rid of that 18% nuclear surcharge that are on SCNG customers' bills every month. So we caught up with Senate Judiciary Chairman uh, Luke Rankin to get his thoughts on these accusations and also uh, what he expects to see happen with, with S-954 once it comes back to the Senate since it's been amended. And again, we expect that activity to happen somewhat sometime next week uh, when House lawmakers take up that bill, expected it to be taken up on the House floor. Here's uh, Chairman Rankin right now. A lot, of, a lot of moving parts here, a lot of moving pieces, which uh, certainly uh, I don't believe anybody could legitimately call us or myself slow walking this bill. Major consequences uh, to uh, on a whole host of issues, be it uh, constitutional, be it a taking, uh, inviting a lawsuit. Uh, so, you know, there's, we can't do one thing without anticipating the consequences uh, and be uh, thorough in our consideration of this. So, um, we are this week. We took up on Tuesday morning uh, the ORS piece. And in terms of strengthening their ability to look, uh, to regulate uh, from an enforcement power standpoint, uh, as well as um, uh, the considerations that they should have as their charge. The House has passed a bill there. We took that one up. Uh, there'll be some progress on that. We may get to that uh, on full committee the next week or the following week. Uh, so a whole lot involved here from Public Service Commission uh, reform Today we have just uh, adopted the extension of the calendar whereby folks will be able to file to run for the Public Service Commission. Uh, so again, I don't think you can point to any one thing um, to say that we are not being judicious. We're not the quickest body. The House prides itself on um, passing bills quickly and then oftentimes coming over to us and saying, please, take your time and fix what we passed. So I take that charge uh, seriously and the work that we have in the Judiciary Committee even more seriously. I'm definitely concerned about what's going on in the Senate right now. The, the House has taken quick and fast action through a deliberative process. We started studying this issue in, in, in August of this year and taking testimony. And we've worked through these issues and we've come out with one goal and that's to provide r relief to ratepayers. Relief to ratepayers is the only thing that we should be thinking about right now in our state. And I am concerned about things being slow walked in the Senate, but the good thing is we've given them two options. We've given them our baseload um, repeal act that has gone forward over there and is sitting over there that takes the 18% nuclear premium to zero as well. And then we've also answered their resolution they sent to us, and, and we honor the dates they put in that resolution. But the only other thing we added was, in the meantime, while the PSC is, is being deliberative and studying this issue, to reduce the rates, take the rate back down to zero. Let's give and put an emphasis on giving ratepayers relief in our state. And I think that has to be primary concern, number one concern for lawmakers that are up here in Columbia right now. So we've given the Senate two options. I'm absolutely concerned about um, the, the pace they're moving because every day that passes, $1.2 million is, uh, is being charged of our ratepayers for a nuclear premium, again, for a nuclear project that will not see the light of day. And our ratepayers, our citizens deserve better. And we caught up with Governor Henry McMaster at that school safety summit today here in Columbia, where there were three roundtable meetings that he attended, uh, one dealing with educators, one dealing with law enforcement officers, and one dealing with mental health professionals. They're all searching for some solutions on what to do with gun violence problems that are, of course, issues across the country. And we've seen students bringing guns to school here in South Carolina and even having our own uh, school shooting two years ago. 
So a lot of, a lot of concerns that we heard from. Uh, McMaster is no longer really talking about arming teachers. He said that he would sign a bill uh, if it got sent to him to arm teachers. However, he's kind of backtracked to his original executive budget proposal, which is to put an SRO, a school resource officer, in every school in every county in the state. Now, a lot of schools already have these SROs in place. However, a lot of rural districts do not due to resource problems, due to funding problems, essentially. So he put $5 million in his executive budget, uh, which is, of course, working its way now through the House and Senate, actually just in the House right now, because they've just proposed the budget, which will go before lawmakers on the House floor uh, in mid-March. So uh, he, he's not exactly gone away from Army teachers, but really wants to focus on SROs in schools, because he sees that as the most important solution to this problem. But one thing for sure is we must, before we get into those kind of questions, we must be sure we have, first of all, a trained uh, police officer, a trained certified armed police officer in every school, every day, any time a child is there in every county in our state. That is, that is the beginning of, of the program. That is the essential foundation to any program in keeping the children safe in school. We must do that, and that's why I included that in my budget. I hope the legislature includes it in the budget as well. And uh, without that, we, are, uh, we, we will not achieve the right result. But that is the very first step, and it must be done in all counties and all schools every day, any time a child is there. Did you know that every school in the state is required to have a fire drill once a month? They have to have one within the first two weeks of school. We haven't had anybody killed in a fire in over 70 years, but that's how active we are with those drills, but yet we don't require these shooter drills. So we need to review all of our safety requirements. We'll work with the legislature on that, and we need to update, update those, and I think implement them as soon as possible, if not immediately, as, at least in this next school year when we start. Even back in 2016, I'll tell you, one of our recommendations was that every student in South Carolina, every school needs access to a mental health counselor. Uh, Akil Ross, our national principal of the year, tells me over and over this is the number one thing that he sees growing and growing the social and emotional problems that students are bringing. We have got to increase that access. We can do it. The ideal is with a person, a mental health counselor, but the next best thing is telepsychiatry, which is available, and we need to make sure that that's um, available in every school in this state. And the House today also concurred with the Senate amendments on that chicken bill that we heard uh, heavily debated over in the Senate for the past three weeks. It would loosen restrictions and regulations on livestock farming operations in the state. Now, before that bill now goes to the governor's desk for his likely signature, we got to hear from Representative Bill Taylor and his nonchalant way of poking fun at the Senate and what they did for the past three weeks. Yeah, the question I have, the, the Senate, the other body, did they not spend better part of three weeks debating and filibustering this bill? Uh, yes, sir, they did. And you're telling us the end result of three weeks of debate and filibuster is this one amendment? Uh, they, they did move the word agri they did remove the word agriculture in four different places. That's part of the amendment. Man, that is heavy lifting. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. <laughs> Glad to help you. And that wraps up our Thursday coverage of the legislature here and closes out the eighth week of the session. But our coverage doesn't stop here. You can listen to South Carolina Public Radio's State House Week every Friday with Russ McKinney, who recaps the week's legislative activity. You can also check out This Week in South Carolina at 7.30 p.m. every Friday evening. Charles Bierbauer this week sits down with uh, Brian Sterling, Director Brian Sterling from South Carolina Department of Corrections to talk about cell phones in prisons as well as recidivism rates. And the South Carolina Lead podcast, which I host every Tuesday, it drops right on your cell phone. And we talk with uh, the reporters who cover the State House and get insight from them on the top issues that they're covering. You can also watch this live every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 7 p.m. on SCE TV's Facebook page, our YouTube page, and my Twitter account at Gavin Jackson. And don't forget about the State House Daybook, which is published every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday on SCETV.org. I'm Gavin Jackson for SCE TV here in Columbia.